All right. I'm going to start a little early today um, because I'm ready. I've got my cold brew. All right. Let's uh, let's take a look at the question. Um, I've already copied day two into day three. So just some scaffolding stuff. Um, I left the library stuff for the non-parser in here because it seemed like a good idea. Let's see. Uh, something about binary numbers. Okay. So puzzle input is a list of binary numbers. When decoded properly, can tell you many useful things about the conditions of the submarine. The first parameter to check is the power consumption. So we're going to need to generate two new binary numbers. Power consumption can then be found by multiplying the gamma rate by the epsilon rate. Each bit in the gamma rate can be determined by finding the most common bit in the corresponding position of all numbers. For example, given this, considering the only the first bit, there are five bits and seven one bits, or five zero bits. So zero four, three, seven, five. That makes sense. Most common second bit of the numbers is the diagnostic report is zero. So the second bit of the gamma rate is zero. Most common value of the third, fourth, and fifth bits are, so we're going horizontally and then per column to determine what the gamma rate is. Okay, so we get a binary number or 22 in decimal. So the epsilon rate is the least common bit so we've got the most common bit and the least common bit we just need to track both of them and as long as we track both of them we're good um, and then we take the two numbers and we multiply them as is such the typical kind of approach okay so let's take the mock input and let's do i guess let's do something that we haven't been doing in a while let's do let's test something oh i didn't even copy it i always forget how to write the so i just run over here and I do this, and then I don't have to care. But I can stick the test input here, and yeah, seems like it'll be good. So this will be test demo data. Um, we'll have like, I don't know, a process function or something. And then what's the answer that we're looking for? 198. So we'll write a process function. Uh, process will take the string slice. Let's move these all to the left so I don't mess everything up. Uh, it'll take the string slice. So in our main function here, what we'll do is we'll just read to string and then pass it to process. I'm just going to write it all in part one because I don't know what part two is going to do. And then we'll move it into the lib if we have commonalities. So the way that I'm thinking about this, let's write function process here. And then cargo test. Will that just work? Unexpected token. I don't know why I made that an array. Um, it's not an array. Okay, so that should work now or not, I guess. Process takes zero arguments. That's true. We're just going to call it input and we're going to make it a stir. And then the return is just going to be zero for now so that the test fails. Uh, of course, I didn't write. Do we think this is only going to be positive? Do I32. Use of undeclared type submarine. Let's get rid of this. Okay, so we have a test. Test is failing. That is exactly what we wanted it to do. What do we do? We have config test. And config test is a conditional compilation flag for the like test flag, basically. Right. So what happens when you run cargo test? like that, like cargo test, is it passes the test flag to Rust C, the Rust compiler, um, for this module, which means that this whole module, so this is an attribute macro on the entire item, which is a module in this case, or a submodule. This whole test submodule will either get compiled in if we're running tests, or it won't be compiled in if we're not running tests, which is great. And then we get to use super star. So super is the parent module. The parent module happens to be in the same file right now. so. This process is part of the parent module, which is why we can access it down here because we brought it into scope. Uh, that's a, typically a super useful thing to do when you're writing tests. We do a const for the input. Um, I just did that for simplicity's sake. It's going to be a string slice when we bring it in. It's going to be an FS read file, whatever, uh, read to string kind of thing when we put it in the main. And then we use the attribute macro test to run tests. Uh, this modifies our thing a little bit, but basically we can use regular Rust functions to do testing. So we have fun, uh, function with some random name. Name doesn't matter at all. And then we use the assert equal macro to test if the expected um, output 198 is equal to the value of the function that we have operating on the input. And then on the left here, we can see that that failed because it should fail because uh, we are returning zero from process right now and we actually want 198. So this will tell us like left and right and not just like, Hey, this one didn't equal like zero didn't equal four. Okay. Which one returned four, which is something that I really like about the cargo testing macros and stuff. 
it'll be like on the left hand side we had 198 and on the right hand side we had this and they didn't match okay so how are we going to do this um Basically, we have this thing and we need to operate on each of the columns of the file. So we have to read the entire string into memory. We are not going to get away with like doing line by line on this one. And then we kind of have to like turn it, I guess. Like that makes me think about matrices. Um, so let's do Rust or let's do like crates.io and let's just search for like matrix, Ma matrix, matrix. If I can type matrix, this is three years ago, three years ago, 10 months ago. I don't know that I want to use something that was shipped that long ago right now to lib.rs. So I know that um, Bevy uses Glam, but I don't think like Glam is meant for gaming stuff. So it has like a, a VEC 2D, a VEC 3D, like that kind of thing. But we have what, five by arbitrary matrice. So we need something else. The ND VEC crate, ND VEC. Um, Maybe you meant ND array? ND array, 10 days ago. Um, but anyway, this is uh, Glam, which is interesting just because I mentioned it. This is the underlying math library that Bevy uses for all of its stuff. So you can see that we have like uh, VEC2, VEC3, VEC4, that kind of thing. Uh, but also lib.rs is another potential like way to find things. So if you search matrix on lib.rs, you get slightly different results than crates.io, I think. Okay, so ND array crate provides an n-dimensional container for general elements and for numerics. N-dimensional, I believe is what we need. One-dimensional rows or columns. Two-dimensional matrices. Okay, each dimension is also called an axis. Um, array base, that looks relevant. N-dimensional array type itself. Main specific array is array, which owns its elements. Generic and dimensional array slicing with arbitrary step size and negative indices to mean elements from the end of the axis. That's kind of cool. I don't think we need that, but that's kind of cool. I feel like I know a bunch of people that did like math related things in college and I didn't. So I stopped at basic calc array views. So this is kind of interesting. We can do some heap allocation stuff and well, I guess we're not going to have a, a different implementation, but like we could play around with views and stuff. Uh, zip for lockstep function application across two or more arrays or item producers. Does that mean that we can do this across all of the rows? I think that's what that means. So like if we have a matrix, matrix and each of the things is an array, right? It's either array or array base. Then I think what this is saying is we can operate on the items in a matrix with zip. Zip allows matching several producers to each other element wise and applying a function over all tuples of elements, one item from each input at a time. The tuples thing makes me nervous because we have a non-defined amount, but let's get the, let's get it into an array or a matrix or whatever we have to do here first. Array, concatenate, a zip. I'm looking for some kind of like instantiation y kind of thing. I'm assuming we don't take like array from or something like that, like this. Create a two dimensional array with elements from X's. So this is our matrix, right? This set of problems definitely felt like a bigger challenge for Rust for me than if I were to use another language. We could also do it a different way. I'm thinking matrix stuff because the way that this went in my head originally. So let's go over what the what the simpler like non-matrix solution would be. I would basically parse all of these in, right? I would go line by line, and then I would probably have like a vec of vex or something like that. And I would push each of these in either as we saw them or uh, I guess we're doing some calculations. So like this would come in and I would say like the first vec gets uh, either a zero or a one or like a negative one or a one or something like that. And then I would just do that through all of the lines. And then we would end up with a vec of vex in the order that we wanted them to. And then we could loop over those vex and do like a filter for the ones and a filter for the zeros or something like that. Or we could be fancy and we could do the counts at the same time, but really it doesn't matter. And then I would take those counts and do the new one out of those, out of that VEC of VEC calculations, right? So um, it would be really inefficient, I think, because we'd be allocating a bunch of VEX or an arbitrary amount of VEX, depending on how many things we're dealing with, but it would work. So that's how I would do it if I wasn't doing matrix stuff. Um, if that explanation wasn't, useful, then feel free to ask questions or whatever. But that's how I would have done it, um, probably.
I just didn't feel like writing two solutions today. Create a two dimensional array with elements from X's. So this is gonna be the thing, right? So R2, and then we get like a shape thing here. So let's check the shape. Cargo add and D array. And then in process, we'll take the string. And this takes like already parsed stuff, I guess. So maybe we do input.lines. Okay, input.lines, we need to create uh, a set of arrays here. They're gonna be five element arrays, but we're not gonna really care about that. Can we input that lines row row dot split and we're going to collect that into a vec of string slices and then this and then that. Okay, so test still failing. Um, let's debug stuff looks fine. Oh, uh, split is not good though. I bet you we could slice into this somehow, but I'm just gonna go easy mode done. Apparently can't do that. What did I do? Really? Interesting. Not exactly sure what happened there, but it said that I had a stir and not a string slice. I wonder if that would also have been true if I had content in here. It is, so interesting. I would have expected that to be string slice, but I guess since it's a literal car into digit, um, I could, do we need to do that yet though? All right, debug stuff, we have the thing. I just wanna get this in here for the moment. Um, let's copy and paste this line and this will go away. The trait fixed initializer is not implemented for vec of string slices. That's interesting. Maybe we have to do it into an array. Let's go check out what fixed initializer is because I have never used ND array before and that seems like a good thing. As init slice length fixed size array used for array initialization. Okay, so it has to be an array and it can't be any larger than 16, it looks like. That seems weird, right? Like, why would it only be implemented up to like, okay. So one thing that I will say is we don't have generics. So the way that you have to do the implementation for um, a trait like this across an arbitrary number of arrays in the past up until recent releases has been um, that you have to do the implementation for every length. So that's why we have 16 implementations for 16 lengths. And then like the question is how many of those do you actually want to write by hand and how many do you want to maintain? Um, so people often end up just like picking an arbitrary number to stop at. But I wonder what that means for us. Cause it means we can't use a vec here. It means we have to use an array or like a, a slice at least, right? Well, I don't think we can use a slice actually now that I'm thinking about it, right? Cause it's not implemented for slices. It's implemented for arrays of length 16. Vecs do work with shapes. What's a shape? A contiguous, a contiguous array of n dimensions, either C or F memory ordered, row major. Row major is something that I have seen, but I don't actually understand. Um, I haven't done a lot of like, what's the Python library that has that? I'm blanking on the name. It's a really common one. It's a linear algebra Python library that I can't remember the name of. Anyway, um, but I have seen that word before. So this is from dimension, create a shape from dimension using the default memory layout into shape, clone from raw dim strides. So do we have to create a dimension? What's a dimension? <laughs> Learning a lot about this library today. I've clearly never used it before. So we're all into new things here. Um, dimension, so dimension is like one axis. So I guess like the, the row would be a dimension. Does that make sense? Array shape and index trait. This trait defines a number of methods and operations that can be used on dimensions and indices. This trait cannot be <laughs> implemented outside of this crate. Okay. Dimensions and indices. So into dine as array view size checked. I'm just looking for vec in the library right now to see if there's like a from vec or a two vec or something like that from shape vec creates a one dimensional array from a vector, no copying needed. So we can create arrays. So where's our array 2d thing? Oh, this is the, this is a lot of documentation. It's generally a good idea to avoid nested vec array types. Okay, that's what I was just about to do. So I'm glad I read this. Um, such as vec vec a, this is exactly what I did, uh, or vec array 2a, because they require extra heap allocations. Yes, knew that. Um, scatter data all over memory. Yes. Um, they cause unnecessary indirection, traversing multiple pointers to reach the data. Yes, but that's the same as the last two. Uh, they don't enforce consistent shape within the nested vex, and they're generally more difficult to work with. That doesn't seem true yet. 
Most common case where users might consider using nested VEX arrays is when creating an array by appending rows subviews in a loop, where the rows subviews are computed within the loop. However, there are better ways than using nested VEX and arrays. If you know ahead of time the shape of the final array, the cleanest solution is to allocate the final array before the loop and then assign the data to it within the loop. And then we push stuff in. If you don't know ahead of time the shape of the final array, then the cleanest solution is generally to append the data to a flat back and then convert it to an array at the end. You just have to be careful that the layout of the data, the order of the elements in the flat back is correct. Compute row and append it to data and calls. I also like, I don't think that advent of code lends itself to maintainable code because it's a bunch of puzzles. It's a bunch of, so there's, there's a big difference between like building something for production that will live for months or years or something like that and building something for advent of code, which is a one-off or like a shell script or something like that, which is basically one-off and you're never really gonna touch it again. Um, and I don't think that it being sort of unmaintainable for advent of code or for one-off shell scripts or something like that is a bad thing. I think there are things you can do, of course, if you like one-off things often turn into long-term maintainable things. So there are things you can do to make them more maintainable when you write them the first time. Uh, I think, for example, like if I was writing a one-off shell script, I would use new shell instead of bash at this point, because I believe that would be more maintainable with less effort over time. Or I would write it in a programming language like Rust or something like that, right? But yeah, I don't know. Let's try this to start with. We know we have two-dimensional array. Uh, we know we have to zero it out. Um, we can take this vec of vex that we did awful things with. And um, I guess... I don't know if this which direction that is. That is rows and then columns. Yeah. Stuff.len here. And then stuff zero dot len here. And then r axis iter mute axis zero enumerate. Perform calculations and assign to row. Okay, so this is I wish they didn't use fill here. Um maybe just row equals compute row and append it to data. We already have this. It wants us to create it with a size and then extend. So can we can we just do this? We already have this. So maybe we don't do the thing that we were doing and we just try to array two from shape vec. Come on, keyboard, you can do it. There we go. The connection on this the keyboard is loose. Um n rows and n calls don't exist. So this is stuff.len and stuff zero dot len. Oop. And then we need that data thing, right? What is data here? Data is a vec, and the rows are also vex. So this is stuff. We need to get rid of that. Can I use the question mark operator? So we could do error handling here, or I could just unwrap it. At some point, I'm going to do error handling. But array two not found in this scope, because that's nd array, array two. And then it fails. So semi expected, right? Shape error out of bounds, out of bounds indexing. Still out of bounds. Interesting. Um, let's do this. Let's debug. So this is 12 and that's five. That seems right, but shape error out of bounds indexing. I think it's because the data is flattened in the example. Is it? It's one giant vec is what you were saying. See, but row is a vec here. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you're saying. So if we're going to do that, then I think we can do it in the collect up here, right? I don't know that it's a good idea to do it in the back up here. So let's just keep doing it like this, but we still need those two numbers. And then we do, we're just going to do a bunch of allocation here. It's fine. Um, back new is what we did and rows can literally do the same exact thing. And then we'll clean it up later. We'll make it a little bit more optimum or whatever. Why is this for I and zero two rows of back data extends from slice. So for we're going to do for, for, I've used row, I've used data, uh, what do I call this? For bits in stuff. So we have n rows and n calls. So I will make these n rows, n calls. n rows equals zero. This doesn't need to be that because we already have that data. For bits and stuff, row is this, bits. And then I missed something because I think Rust formatter isn't borrowed here after move. Yes, of course it is. Stuff.len is n rows and calls. And this is going to be data, not stuff. Cannot borrow is mutable because I didn't make it. Part one, yes. Okay, so we've got panic that assertion failed, which is what we want. 
So now we have R. Is this going to even debug? Can this even debug? So we have a matrix. That was not the cleanest. Um, but again, I've never used this library so before, so I'm not super concerned about it. And we can always come back and clean this up later, which we probably will. Okay, so we now need to like transpose the array by reversing axes. I don't think I want to reverse. I think I just want to like rotate or like a swap axes. Oh, it is. <laughs> it is reversed axes, I guess. See if that worked. There's also column iterators. It is a really nice Mac. Oh, debug is so good. Uh, for sure, 100%, so good. I believe you can say let variable equals debug 10. It Yes, that does work. 100% that does work. Um, so this would work as well. You can basically like debug, the debug macro will pass through whatever expression you gave it and then print the expression. So in this case, we get um, r.t and then we get the value out. It's really nice for sure. Um, I tend to not use it in that position though, interestingly. Uh, personal quirk, I guess, but it is definitely a valid way to do it. So I think this is what we were looking at earlier that I wanted. I don't need a dot rows. I need tar dot rows. Of course, I didn't bring in zip. Let's do this. Let's do use ND array a to, um, for some reason, Rust Analyzer is having a lot of trouble with like, I wonder if VS Code needs an update. <laughs> I don't even think the type inlays are working. Arari one, array one. Let me go over here and look at this. We need array one and axis for this to work, at least. I don't think that is actually the thing. Oh, <laughs> you know what I did? Uh, I tried to sum uh, strings, slices. The trait num traits indice identity zero is not implemented for string slice, obviously, because it's a string and not a number. Let's do this. Actually, this will be... I don't know what to do here, actually. Uh, do I allocate I32 amounts of space for a bit? Or do I do I allocate? I, th I think I allocate I32 for now because we're going to have to sum. And I don't know what sum does, and we'll figure it out later. But X says a type of value vec I32 cannot be built from an iterator over of type string, which is super easy. Um, v v.parse um, dot unwrap because we don't care about the error because all of this has to work. Doesn't need to be a reference anymore because it's a number. So this is this is quite often how I end up going through uh, Rust code. I start hitting errors and then I look at the errors and I read them and then I bring it over here. Cannot find value A in this scope uh, because I messed something up. Where's A? A dot n rows, tar dot n rows. Value of vec string slice. Okay, yes. My second type signature here is now wrong because we changed it. Okay, so we've got that and then you know why I do this, actually? Um, because I find it easier to remove entire lines when I'm debugging, and I want to like enable or disable different lines of debug rather than putting it around a value because it's harder for me to do like the front and the back of uh, an expression than it is for me to enable and disable a line. Uh, result is unit, so that's not the right thing. We need totals, I think. Okay, so totals there. That's great. <laughs> the way I was thinking about doing this is if this number is greater than half of the number of values, then it's a one. And if it's less than half, then it's not. I'm wondering if there are other things to do. Because like, yes, some, but also totals isn't something we need, I don't think. Like we can just do, well, we're zipping from totals actually, which is interesting. So what if we do this and we do row dot, Rust Analyzer is still not working, so I got to figure out what row is on my own. <laughs> Dang it. Um, I'm going to assume a row is an array one. Actually, we can we can find this out easily, right? This is zip from... So an array one, uh, we've got an array. So do we have... We have iter. We have concatenate, stack, stack new axis. Zip, slice, concatenate into iterator. So we could just iterator over this. If I knew um, more about how the matrix library worked, I could probably figure out a better way to do this. Technically an array view. Yeah, I think they are all based in the same stuff though, right? From shape pointer, into scalar, reborrow, split at, complex. Yeah, we end up with basically the same amount or the same functions, I think. Um, does the rest have count on iter? I don't want count on the total iter. I don't really want to have to sort it either. Like what I want is the count of ones or zeros. 
which is fine. It's whatever. I guess some does give me the number of ones, doesn't it? Technically. <laughs> That's actually a really good point. Where is this? So let's what? What are these things called again? Binary numbers in your diagnostic group are gamma and epsilon. Which one of these is the common one? Gamma is common. So let gamma, epsilon. So two things here. One, I'm using vex here. Two, I could use bit vec because these actually are bits. Um, but I think I'm just going to do this for a second. Actually, now that I'm doing this, I'm wondering if I can collect it. I can collect it now that I'm thinking about it, but I don't think I'm going to. Expected unit found. Oh, uh, right. Because I didn't. Because debug returns the value. Okay. Y'all can get commented for a second. 4T and or 4V and tar.iter. So we get a bunch of ones and zeros. Wait, why do we get a bunch of ones and zeros? Because tar is not the thing we want. Totals is the thing we want. So 75875 is that what we expected? It matches the pattern here anyway. Why do I do this? How do I do a guard? I forget guard syntax. If V is greater than, what is it? And rows and calls over two, then we do something else. We do something else. Expected I32 found U size. I can just do, right? What's the syntax for this? It's two, two underscore U size, right? There's something here. I forget what it is. There we go. I know that V can go into U size because V is an I32. Of course, gamma is going to cause me problems here but should have left those commented out. One, 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 one. That is wrong. I did my math wrong. Okay, n calls is five. It's n rows, isn't it? Is it n rows? It is n rows, right? So we have 12, seven is greater than half, five is less than half, but that does not give us what I was expecting. So I did something wrong here. V is U size. All oh, right, because I didn't change this. That's what happens when you separate your debugs out. Okay, so let's comment this out again. Let's take a look. We'll go one, zero, one, one, zero. Is that right? One, zero, one, one, zero. That is right. So these are the commons. So if we have more ones than we have uh, zeros, then gamma dot push one, epsilon dot push zero. Otherwise, it's the other way around. Gamma dot push zero, epsilon dot push one, which should give us one, zero, one, one, zero and zero, one, zero, zero, one. So we have our two numbers now. And we have to convert them to decimal. And so there's a couple of things, right? Um, one is I know there's this library called Bitvec, which we could be using for this. I don't know that it gives us like a number. I vaguely remember using this last year and getting numbers out of it, but I don't remember exactly how to use it. That's a macro, which I don't think I want. Yeah. So this is basically what we're going to do here. And then I think I can just convert this. So it's taking true and false. Safety, performance, capacity, reallocation, drain elements, force align from VEC, insert into raw parts, leak, new pop. This is the other thing we could do too. Um, BitVEC has count ones. So instead of doing the matrix like addition, uh, we could put everything into a BitVEC and then count ones, count zeros, which is kind of one of the reasons that I want to get it from a BitVEC into a number. Not what I want. This is probably also not what I want. Prelude, local bits. Primes, that it? That was gonna recall bit and bits.iter by val enumerate. When did GitHub add little arrows for spaces and tabs? That's the debug flag. Uh, it's not really what I want. Zero B, display still prints out the binary representation. Can I do that? That's call, that calls display too. So that gives me the display implementation, which is not what I want. What is domain? Domain is not what I want either because it can't be, uh, all right, I'm going to look at last year. <laughs> uh, advent of code. Clearly, I only do um, bit manipulation once a year. <laughs> Let's see. Day eight from last year looks like it has a bit back. Maybe it's not actually in here. There we go. What is a seat here? Use size. So use size is a platform specific uh, integer. Num 13. 13 is wrong. I guess that's why I had reverse. 22. There we go. We'll do a bit back and this will be false and this will be true. And we cargo test. Uh, and then I print things out correctly because that's important. Assuming it's not going to go over an I32 anyway. Okay. So that gives us the right answer. <laughs> uh, what a mess is my uh, evaluation of that. Um, to give a brief rundown of what we did, because that did take quite a while. 
uh, to learn the matrix library and then go find the Bitvec stuff. Um, what we did is we have a process here. So we have a test that asserts that 198 is the answer that we want. We process it. We're processing this list of new line separated like bits, basically. And we decided to go with uh, a super naive approach of basically just creating a VEC of VEX of I32s from that data. So we've got like one zero one zero one zero. Um, we get the number of rows and the number of columns from that data, which we use to create a matrix, basically using ND array. Um, we transpose the matrix, which I'm going to get rid of that to bug. And then we sum up each of the values in the matrix um, using zip. Once they're summed, that gives us the number of zeros and the number of ones for each. And we create the gamma and the epsilon uh, bit vex. And bit vex are just a way to like store arbitrary bit data. Um, so bit vex, if we have basically more ones than zeros, gamma gets a one, and epsilon gets a zero. Um, because we're using a bit structure or like a bit vector, we can use Booleans here and it knows what we mean. And then we have to reverse it because it starts to the wrong side otherwise. And then we load it. Um, I guess we're loading it into a U8. So I don't actually need these into's and this can be I32 and these can go away. Uh, what did I do here? Not implemented for I32. Okay. That's fine. Interesting. Do I need to return an I32 here? I don't think so. I think I can change the signature. So we load it into an I30 or U32 um, starting at zero. I guess we could also start at the end, but okay. So that's part one. Um, let's get the data in here, puzzle input. And hopefully we wrote this in a way that just works. So read to string, process, file, print line, process file. So theoretically this is the answer. Gold star, yes. Um, and just for kicks, I'm gonna do the heap allocation. This is going to be an absolute disaster of a um, heap allocation diagnostic, but I want a baseline for when I work on it later. Like I said, um, this is more heap allocation than we've used on anything so far. And it's one of the least, like it doesn't, ha it, it's bits, right? <laughs> so we've got uh, a bunch of work we can do later. Okay. Let's see, Chris Biscardi, is that going to work? There we go. So we have a stream tomorrow right here. So if you go to the channel, it'll be here. Um, and it is for 22 hours from now. So noon on Saturday. Um, and I will catch you all then. Thanks for hanging out, y'all.